it, touching on, I mean, you brought up his his death. Then, uh, obviously, he didn't commit suicide. He was uh, pursued by the Colombian National Police. Uh, I think special mention has to go to well, well, uh, Hugo Martinez was leader of Search Block, wasn't he? And his son essentially found Pablo Escobar through tracking. I, I mean, uh, Juan Pablo, Pablo's son is the, the breadcrumb trail that led the police to Pablo as he was getting desperate. Um, what was that day like? For I, I'll ask you, St- Steve, first, because it's a different story for Javier. But. Well, it was <clears throat> after Pablo was, you know, well, first of all, I was with the other Americans at the base when, you know, and other Americans I'm talking about, the uh, U.S. Army's Delta Force and U.S. Navy SEAL Team 6, And even the CIA was there with us. Um, And I'm talking to them just, you know, casual conversation when I noticed the executive staff for the colonel rushing over to his office. And and that was a clear indication something was going on. Well, Javier and I had such a good relationship with Colonel Martinez that we could go over to his office. And he didn't didn't just barge in. You had to be respectful. But, you know, I walked over to the door and, and he motioned for me, come on in. And that's when he was talking to his son. And his son had just told him, hey, I just found Pablo. And I saw him with, you know, 100% confirmation i've seen him he's on the phone in this in this row house and the colonel is telling him you know use this special unit of guys that javier and i worked with for the whole 18 months it's called Dehim, and these are the guys that engaged pablo in the firefight that day uh he said you know contain the situation don't let him get away we're on the way you know we're bringing the search block well the search block consists of 600 people you know it takes a while to get everybody together to get the vehicles out there, the trucks and the Jeeps and, and so forth, to issue weapons, you know, uh, make assignments. That's not something you do in just a couple of minutes. So they went ahead and, and uh, they were worried, you know, we had 100% confirmation Pablo was in there. So they were worried that, that something might happen. Maybe he had an escape route that we weren't aware of. So they went ahead and made entry into this row house. Uh, when they got to the second floor, that's when they engaged Pablo in a firefight. He started shooting at them and they fired back. He made it up to the third floor, jumped out the window onto the roof of a two-story row house behind him. This was surprising. He only had one bodyguard that day. Here's a guy who at one point had as many as 500 Sicarios protecting him. And on the day he died, only had one, which is a testament to the progress that was being made against his organization. So his bodyguard jumps out first. He runs across the roof. Uh, The police tell him to drop his weapons. And you got policemen on the ground. He sees them. He fires at them. And they shoot him and kill him. He falls off the roof. Pablo jumps out that window. He knows that his Limon, his bodyguard, has already been killed. He knows that the cops are coming in to that third story window and that he's going to be caught in a crossfire. Or at least that's what I believe he knew. Uh, he's trying to make his way across the roof. The cops get to the third floor window. They order him to drop his weapons. He turns around and fires at them and the police catch him in a crossfire. That's the day he's killed. Now, when it came across the radio, you know, it, the major that was in charge of the operation made the statement, Viva Colombia, Pablo is dead. Well, it's a lot of cheering, high-fiving, backslapping going on in the office. But you know what? We had been to situations before where we thought we had Pablo captured. And so even though you're excited that maybe this is finally over, you still got a little bit of hesitation in the back of your mind that, let's go confirm this before we get too excited, you know, before we give it up and say, okay, it's over with. So I run back to the, I need to call my boss in Bogota and tell him what's going on. Our boss, Joe Toft. Um, I can't get a hold of him in the embassy. You know, they're putting me on hold. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Wait. Finally, Joe comes, comes up on the radio. He tells me that Pablo has been killed. <laughs> and what had happened, and this is a testament to the relationship that DEA had with the Colombian National Police. The head of the Colombian National Police, the first person he called was Joe Toft to tell him that Pablo Escobar was dead. So, you know, I'm, we're having a little conversation and the boss says, hey, your job is to get out there and confirm that this is Pablo, no mistakes. Well, I go grab my gear out of, the, out of the bunkhouse. I come running out. The entire search block is gone. They're already on their way out to the site. I don't have a car. I don't have access to a car. I don't even know how to rent a car, <laughs> you know, in Medellin, Colombia. Um, and the only people in the base are the guards. So I'm, I'm, you, a million things are going through your mind. And lo and behold, here comes Mar- Colonel Martinez driving back up. He's got his driver and his bodyguard in his Jeep. He wanted to get his video camera. So he, he, he yells at me, Stick, what are you doing? They had a hard time saying my name's Steve, so it came out as Stick. 
everybody called me stick down there. So he said, stick, what are you doing? And I said, Colonel, can, or, can I ride out with you? And he's like, get in the Jeep, let's go. So I go out with Colonel Martinez. It turns out that my camera is the only one that's working that day. So that's why we have all access to all the photographs that we have. Um, but while we're there, you know, the media is starting to show up. Thousands of people were coming in because they just heard this big gun battle and everybody's coming to see and the rumors quickly spread that it was Pablo Escobar and all that. Um, as the media showed up, we, me being the, you know, the gringo out there and, and Javier would have done the same thing. We didn't want to take any credit away from the Colombian National Police. So I got with Lieutenant Colonel Pelias, who was, uh, you know, one of our good friends and, and we discussed the situation. He said, we're going to get you back to the base. <laughs> So they assigned me a security detail, took off to the base. Well, later, you know, a couple hours later, all the search block comes back in. We're still celebrating, but we're also expecting a retaliation attack that night. So there wasn't any drinking and all that going on. You know, everybody was sober. They tripled the guards on the, on the perimeter of the compound. Uh, you already slept with your gun in your bed, but, you know, you were just a little more, more vigilant that night uh, because we really thought the Sicarios would attack us. It was the quietest night I ever spent in Medellin, Colombia. But the personal feeling to get out there and confirm that that's Pablo Escobar, honestly, it felt like the weight of the world was lifted off your shoulders. You know, uh, felt like we were actually going to be able to get back to what a normal lifestyle is for a DEA agent living in Colombia. Because uh, what we have been going through for 18 months wasn't normal. But it really was. It was just a great feeling of elation that, you know, we played a little part and helping to bring down the world's first narco terrorist. Exactly, and it's you know it's a part of history. Um, when you obviously you're you're first on the scene with a camera, uh, the only camera that worked that day, and you take photos and you take photo of Limon on the floor, and then you take photo of you know confirmation that Pablo's there. Whose idea was it that people should start taking photos with his body? <laughs> Oh, I don't know if anybody actually came up with that idea. The, uh, you know, the guys that, that actually killed Pablo were our, that was the unit we worked with. That was the elite group of, of plainclothes police officers. We'd seen so many of our friends killed. Uh, even a major was out on operation, was killed, Major Rano. Um, and and <laughs> it, it was just a, it was, it wasn't a party or a festive atmosphere, but it was a very happy atmosphere because, you know, police officer felt like now they're a little bit safer because Pablo's not paying money to have them killed. And so the, you know, first group of, of guys came over and were like, hey, stick, get a, take a picture of us with the body. And so I did that. And then some of the pictures didn't get back to me. The, uh, some of the Columbia police officers didn't want their photos out like that. And, and I understand completely. Uh, but then some of the other guys did. And then after I'm taking pictures, they're like, well, hey, stick, come on over. Let's get a picture with you. And you kind of get caught up in the moment, uh, to be honest with you. It, you know, I certainly didn't mean to desecrate a body like that. That wasn't the intent. But I'll tell you, I was damn happy that Pablo Escobar was dead. Um, when that picture hit Washington, you know, I, I did catch a lot of grief over it because DEA headquarters wasn't very happy that, you know, here's a DEA agent standing over a dead body smiling. Um, so that's how it all happened. You know, yeah. it's not, not one of my prouder moments, but it's kind of paid off in the long run to be honest with you well it's it's a notorious photo i mean the photo the real life photo even ends up in the show you know mm -hmm. it, it it flicks to uh the real life photo um you know and for me personally my only regret that day was that my partner javier wasn't there because you know i was in columbia three years he was there six and a half years i was if just anybody about, deserved to be there that day it was him i mean javier going to you uh do you Obviously, for, for context, you were, you were taken out to Miami uh, for a tip about Pablo Escobar that you yourself believed was a, a, a nothing tip and, and wasn't going to help. Um, do you feel, do you still harbor any regrets or any bitterness towards the fact no. that you weren't there? No, you know what, Harry, not at all. You know what, it was a great feat. Pablo Escobar w was killed. And uh, yeah, I mean, I wish I would have been there. However, you know, the circumstances didn't allow me. And it was, uh, you know, and real quick, I know we're, you know, time here, but uh, the ambassador, 
was basically ordered me to go to Miami. I tried to fight with the ambassador, mm -hmm. try to tell him, sir, we're close, we're, we're on him, uh, we're intercepting him, and uh, the ambassador says, no, nope, you get on the airplane. And you know what the question is, the informant, how did he get to our ambassador? And that, that one I still do not know, and no one seems to remember, but I remember the order, and it was basically either you go to Miami, or I kick you out of the country. And the ambassadors are like president, so all right, I made plans. And uh, the, the informant is sort of a well-known informant. I think we've mentioned him, his name, his nickname is Navigante, who played a big part. And he's the one who did gotcha. He's the one who infiltrated Jose Rodrigo, Rodriguez Gacha Mexicano, who was Pablo's partner. And that's how Gacha ended up getting killed. So he had some credibility. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, it's funny now because when I get there and he's in a secret place in a warehouse, you know, so I, you know, they drive me there and uh, I've got this on the phone. <laughs> And he sees me and he sort of, you know, drops the phone and he's the one who tells me, Javier, they just killed Pablo Escobar. You know what? I didn't even say another word to Navigante. I just turned around. I had an agent with me. We made plans and I was on the airplane coming back. And I always remember the airplane. Uh, uh, I was on American Airlines coming back. And I, and you know who was on that airplane? All the media from Miami, from Univision, Telemundo, all the all the Latin media, you know, to cover the story. Of course, I didn't tell them anything, but uh, you know, but like you know, I was there the next day. You know, when Steve congratulated the guys, came back. But you know what? There's no, you know, of course not. You know what? Pablo Escobar was killed. I'm glad Steve was there. Like he said, he's the only one with a camera. None of those photos would have existed, I think, right, Steve, uh, without, the, without the camera. So anyway, it was a great feeling. And uh, it, it was, it, it's, it's a great feeling in that Pablo Escobar killed a lot of friends of ours, caught, killed a lot of innocent people. So in the end, I think justice was served. Oh, definitely. And the both of you, um, you know, regardless if you, if you missed the firefight or not, or the both of you had huge parts to play in getting justice for those friends that, that you did sadly lose. Um, one thing that is quite striking and that does get mentioned a lot is the fact that when Pablo died, so this is a man who was, uh, you know, the unbelievably rich. Uh, I mean, one of my, one of the most interesting stories I've got is the fact that he built his own zoo imported loads of animals over for his children uh, and now because of his own zoo uh when you imported hippos over colombia now has a hippo population like that's how rich this man is or this man was and then you look at the you know you look at the photos of his dead body or or, or even just the stage is coming to the end of his life he's got this shabby beard he is you know wearing tatty clothes his jeans don't fit him his belly's hanging out uh, he's put on quite a lot of weight. Is that, was it surreal to, to see this man that is essentially like the boogeyman for so long and he's, you know, right at the top and he's organising all these deaths to then see the corpse of just a, a, a shabby middle-aged man, essentially, who doesn't seem like anything special. Is that a surreal uh, image? Uh, you know, I never considered it like that. It was just a relief for me. Um, you know, people say, well, what would, you know, why didn't you do something about Pablo when you saw him? I never saw Pablo until the day he was killed. He was already dead by the time I saw him. Um, you know what? I mean, that's, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. That's, I thought it was a very fitting end for a man who was responsible for tens of thousands of murders uh, one of his own Sicarios said that Pablo himself or Pablo was responsible for as many as 50,000 murders. So I think I thought it was a pr very appropriate end for him the way he went out. That's right. And, and I agree to it. And, and you, you, you make a good point, Harry. Yeah, he was, uh, you know, fat, ugly, right? The beard, the hair all, all over the place, barefooted. But it just shows he was on the run. He had one Sicario left, you know, and in the beginning had thousands and thousands of people protecting him. 
uh, and uh, well protected, you know, in the end, had one, uh, one Sicario left, and uh, look at how he went out. So, again, very fitting.